As 1916 came to a close, it became obvious that the U.S. would soon be drawn into the conflict in Europe. With that in mind, the War Department began a top-to-bottom review of the entire military infrastructure. They looked at everything, equipment, armament, and personnel. One deficiency they discovered was that the nation didn't have a combat helmet. Now, originally, that wasn't any big deal. In fact, helmets were almost perceived as novelty items. That perception began to change, however, when medical reports from the British and French clearly showed horrendous casualties were being caused in the trenches due to airburst artillery, shrapnel, and hand grenades. This is the story of America's development and adoption of a combat helmet. In 1917, the U.S. General Staff formed a committee to evaluate British, French, and even German helmets to assist in the design of a true American helmet. Prior to official involvement in the war, American volunteers were assisting the French Army in the Ambulance Corps. They were issued the first modern combat helmet, the Adrian, designed by French General Augusta Adrian and equipped with a distinctive American badge. General Adrian's helmet was the first helmet used by Americans in World War I. When the U.S. finally entered the conflict, those Americans serving in the Ambulance Corps were absorbed into the American military. The Adrian was a relatively thin steel helmet with a leather suspension and a leather chin strap. The helmet was evaluated for use by U.S. forces. The U.S. also evaluated the British combat helmet, which was used by the Canadians, Australians, and other Commonwealth countries. The British combat helmet, designed by John L. Brody, was constructed of a much stronger steel and could take more punishment than the French Adrian. However, the helmet wasn't perfect and it provided coverage only to about one-third of a soldier's head. The War Department even reviewed enemy combat helmets such as the German M1916. Considered by many to be the finest helmet of the war, the Stahlhelm provided exceptional coverage to a soldier's head and was very strong. The simple design of its three leather pad suspension was surprisingly robust and comfortable. Coupled with its leather chin strap, the helmet was very stable. The lugs on the side of the helmet could also support a one half inch steel brow plate, which provided even greater protection. With both the French and the British jockeying for the American military to adopt their helmet, what truly tipped the balance was a British offer to provide 400,000 helmets to the Americans immediately. The offer was accepted, and the new helmet was designated the M1917. The adoption of the helmet was considered a stopgap measure until the Army could develop its own helmet, but in the meantime, the Army went to work seeking production bids from steel manufacturers to produce the helmet. The helmet was constructed of a special mixture of steel known as Hadfield manganese. The benefits of mixing the raw steel with 12% manganese was that the mixture was easy to work with. The shape of the combat helmet could be produced with a single draw of a huge steel die. It also didn't require the time-consuming chore of annealing or heat treating the metal. Hadfield manganese could be shaped and would remain very strong even after being pressed. Manufacturing an M1917 helmet was no simple task. The helmet's steel shell consisted of the dome-shaped steel helmet bowl, two chin strap loops, two rivets, and a steel rim. The first step in the process was securing a 20 inch by 20 inch sheet of steel into the press. Next, the shape of the helmet was pressed into the steel and inspected. The helmets were then trimmed and finally welders attached the helmet rim and chin strap loops to the underside of the helmet. Finally, a number was stamped into the underside of the steel shell. This number was referred to as the heat of the steel stamp. This was a control number which could be used to match the helmet up with a particular lot of steel in case defects or flaws were discovered. Once the helmet steel shells were completed, they were boxed up and shipped off to be painted and textured. The newly pressed helmets were placed on a conveyor system for finishing. The helmets were immersed in an olive drab paint and then proceeded to the next stage where fine sawdust was blown on the tacky helmets to provide a texture. This was designed to reduce glare. The helmets then received a second coat of paint. The helmet shells were then placed into a 200 degree oven to cure the paint. With just a few modifications, the US M1917 suspension was a copy of the British suspension. The primary components were a felt pad at the crown of the helmet, cotton twine mesh to provide some adjustment, oil cloth as a headband, and finally the leather chin strap which served as the primary frame of the suspension. The liner not only supported and distributed the weight of the helmet, 
but it also attempted to protect the soldier from injury if a projectile struck the helmet. Along the exterior of the suspension was a leather band of loops that ran the entire perimeter of the suspension. Rubber tubing was inserted into every other loop. This tube system kept the steel shell away from the soldier's head and provided some buffer in the event the helmet was struck by a bullet or shrapnel. The entire system was held in place by a single rivet punched through the crown of the helmet and through the leather chin strap assembly. This was the weak link in the helmet, for if the leather chin strap broke, the entire suspension could fall out. Helmets were tested by shooting selected lots with a 1911 45 caliber handgun at a range of 10 feet. If the bullet penetrated the helmet, cracked it, or caused a dent deeper than 1 and 3 16 inches, the entire lot of helmets was rejected. This helmet is typical of a rejected helmet. A hole was punched in the rear flare and a red stripe painted across the top. They could be used in a training environment, but not in an actual combat situation. During the course of World War I, American steel companies produced two and one half million M1917 combat helmets, the vast majority being pressed in Philadelphia. These saw use across the Army. They were used by the infantry, the tank corps, and artillery units. The helmet was far from perfect. It had many flaws. Its main problem was that its center of gravity was poor and it often flopped forward when a soldier assumed the firing position. A little known fact is that the M1917 wasn't the only combat helmet used by U.S. forces in World War I. Members of the 93rd Infantry Division, a unit formed of African Americans, were shipped to France and outfitted with secondhand French uniforms and equipment, including the French Adrian helmet. The 93rd later adopted the silhouette of a French Adrian helmet as their divisional insignia. The M1917 combat helmet could also be used with a chainmail face shield and protective Wilmer eye shields. These were primarily used by tank crews who were exposed to lead splash. Lead splash was small particles of metal flying off the inside of a tank as the exterior was being struck by bullets. It was late in the war when the U.S. military approved the widespread use of divisional insignias for uniforms. While occasionally an individual doughboy may have painted his unit patch on his helmet, it was absolutely the exception and not the rule. The fact is, the vast majority of unit marked helmets, camouflage painted and souvenir helmets, were painted after the war during the occupation. In fact, some enterprising U.S. units billeted outside of port cities in France set up helmet painting and battle damage businesses. A doughboy about to return to the U.S. could stop by and have his helmet personalized with depictions of battles, insignia, camouflage, and even battle damage. How, you might ask, did so many doughboys manage to keep their helmets? Well, the Secretary of War permitted each soldier to keep one complete combat uniform as their souvenir of participation in the Great War. While the German helmet may have been the finest combat helmet in the war, it was the soldiers wearing the M1917 and its Commonwealth cousins which won the day. The helmet design was truly the badge of the English-speaking soldier. It's interesting how art and history can have an impact on warfare. This is the story of a museum curator tasked with the development and creation of an American combat helmet. From the earliest days of American involvement in World War I, the mission to create and test experimental helmets fell to Bashford Dean. Born in 1867, Dean was a noted zoologist, author, and was the curator of the Arms and Armor Department of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. In 1917, the War Department contacted Dean and congratulated him on being appointed to the rank of major in the U.S. Army Ordnance Department. Dean's position at the museum and his knowledge of historical armor made him an ideal person to coordinate and design experimental helmets for the U.S. military. Dean immediately looked towards foreign helmets currently being used or being tested. This included experimental designs such as the French Adrian equipped with the Pollock visor. While some of the designs considered were extremely functional, some were downright ridiculous, but no ideas were excluded. Of approximately 16 experimental designs considered and created by the Armor Department, four were given serious consideration to become the first unique American combat helmet. The experimental Model 2, developed in June 1917, featured classic designs of 15th century Greece and was pressed from Hadfield manganese. The helmet provided vastly more protection than did the M1917 helmet. Approximately 2,000 Model 2s were produced by Ford & Company in Philadelphia in the fall of 1918. 
The suspension of the experimental Model 2 was copied from the German M1916. Three leather pads provided the cushion. The chin strap was also an improvement as it was independently attached and made from a web canvas. As great an improvement as this helmet was in comparison to the M1917, it was rejected because its shape was considered too similar to the German helmet. Another design greatly influenced by the German helmet was the experimental Model 5. Weighing in at 2 pounds 12 ounces, it too was deeper and provided better protection than the M1917. The Model 5 was produced by Hale & Kilborn, a company from Philadelphia. It was made from Hadfield manganese but was far more difficult to press than the M1917 as it required four draws of the steel press. Like the Model 2, the Model 5 suspension was similar to the German helmet and was constructed primarily of leather. The helmet also relied on a leather chin strap. Again, its similarities to the German helmet ultimately prevented it from being adopted. An excellent example of this is this photo showing a group of American soldiers. A close look, however, reveals what appears to be a German soldier. Actually, it's an American officer testing a Model 5. This World War I staged photo of two American soldiers, one wearing the Experimental 5 and the one with the rifle wearing a German helmet, show just how similar these designs were. The fierce appearance of the Experimental Model 8 with its steel visor made for a distinctive and attractive helmet. Ford produced 1,300 near the end of the war for testing. The helmet could be worn with a visor up or down. It was painted olive drab and coated with a fine mist of sawdust like the M1917. While it was a sturdy, well-built helmet, it wasn't really practical and it received little interest from the Army. It was eventually discarded. Another very interesting design was the Model 6. This helmet had a tilting dome which could serve as a face shield. Apparently only one was produced by Bashford Dean's team of designers. Dean and his team clearly looked at helmets from history's past. The Model 7 was a three-piece steel helmet made in three weights weighing from 11 to 16 pounds. Designed for machine gunners, approximately 50 were produced and tested, but they were absolutely impractical. This photo shows the experimental Model 9. Like the Model 7, it was clearly too heavy and cumbersome for actual combat use. Apparently only one example was produced. The experimental helmet that nearly replaced the M1917 was designated the Liberty Bell. In 1918, the helmet was provisionally adopted as evidenced by articles in Stars and Stripes. Several examples were produced, some with leather chin straps and some with canvas webbing. Several different suspensions were tested, including the M1917 style and the three-pad leather suspension. What prevented the helmet from being adopted wasn't any particular fatal flaw, but the fact that American soldiers just hated its appearance. Even in 1918, the Army realized that if a piece of equipment wasn't accepted by the Doughboys, they wouldn't wear it. The idea of replacing the M1917 with the Liberty Bell was abandoned. Bashford Dean and his team never did produce a design that would be used by American forces, but his helmet designs helped propel the U.S. military forward. Dean went on to write helmets and body armor in modern warfare, the premier reference for information on helmets in the early days of the 20th century. He died in 1928 at age 61. When World War I ended in November 1918, the American military continued to use the M1917 helmet as the standard issue. On several occasions in the 1920s and 30s, the Army dusted off Bashford Dean's designs in an attempt to find something suitable to replace the ill-fitting, borrowed British design. In 1936, the Army once again decided to improve the American combat helmet. The design that had the best shot of replacing the M1917 was the Experimental Model 5A, a derivative design of Bashford Dean's Model 5. This modified design was deeper than its predecessor and provided better protection to the soldier and fit much better than the M1917 thanks to an improved four-leaf leather suspension designed in the 1930s. The Model 5A featured a webbed chin strap independently fastened to the helmet shell. However, history repeated itself and the Model 5A design was declared unsuitable due to its close resemblance to the German combat helmet. So what did the Army do? It retrofitted the M1917 helmet with the four-leaf leather suspension used in the experimental Model 5, added a webbed chin strap and installed it into an M1917 helmet and called the new design the M1917A1. The M1917A1 suspension was an improvement over its predecessor. The suspension was installed with a screw at the crown of the helmet so it could be replaced or repaired if damaged. The chin straps were also sewn to the chin strap loops, which were now part of the suspension. 
Most of the M1917A1 helmets were simply World War I M1917s that had been upgraded. The M1917A1 was used by all members of the U.S. Armed Forces from 1936 until 1942. That's when it was replaced by the famous M1 helmet. From the moment the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, the U.S. military truly wanted a unique and distinctive American combat helmet. Many experimental and prototype designs were created, but they were all rejected for a myriad of reasons. In the 1930s, some of these experimental patterns resurfaced, but once again they were turned down. One idea that had persisted from the 1920s, however, was that of a two-part helmet, a liner system that would fit inside of a steel helmet shell. In 1940, Secretary of War Patterson made the decision not to order additional M1917A1s. This cleared the way for the development and the design of the most famous of all American helmets, the M1. In August 1940, after two decades of foot dragging and indecision, Assistant Secretary of War Robert Patterson finally put his foot down and refused to sign an order for additional M1917A1 helmets. Patterson realized the World War I design was obsolete and ordered the Army's Infantry Test Board to design a new helmet. The assignment for the new helmet fell to Major Harold Sydenham, who worked in the Infantry Board's test section, formerly known as the Department of Experiments. Stationed at Fort Benning with his wife Zelma and young child, Sydenham was known as an innovator for his support of a two-part combat helmet. The M1917A1 and M1917 helmets provided sufficient cover to the crown of a soldier's head, but left far too much of the back of the head and sides exposed. Sydenham reviewed Bashford Dean's experimental helmets and determined that the crown of an M1917 style helmet, coupled with the side and rear protection of an experimental 5A, could be the answer. Under the direction of Sydenham, apparently an M1917 and an experimental Model 5A were taken to a metal shop on Fort Benning. The helmet shells were dissected and the appropriate parts were welded together as you can clearly see in this rare example and then pounded into shape. The design was designated the TS-1 for Test Section Experimental Model 1. As experimentation continued, two other test helmets were constructed. The TS-2 which had a rivet in the crown to hold the suspension in place and the TS-3. The TS-3 design can be identified by a rivet which holds the chin strap in place both the TS-2 and TS-3 were very similar to the TS-1. In the spring of 1941, the final modifications to the experimental TS series of helmets was completed. This consisted of welding chin strap loops to the inside of the shell and then sewing a chin strap onto the loop. Like the M1917 of World War I, the new helmet was ballistically tested and it passed. The new helmet was approved on June 9, 1941 and was designated the M1 helmet. Sydenham's mission, however, was only half done. He now had to develop an appropriate suspension system for the new M1 helmet. From day one, the Army had insisted on a two-part helmet with an independent suspension inside the liner. As luck would have it, Sydenham wasn't the only soldier interested in helmets. A hard-charging Major General named George S. Patton Jr. was seeking improvements to the tank helmet. Patton and Sydenham had at one time both been assigned to Fort Benning, and General Patton knew Sydenham was working on the U.S. Army helmet issues. He contacted him for assistance regarding tank helmets. Sydenham had provided the impetus for airborne units to test football helmets for providing protection in jumps. He also provided some football helmets to George Patton. Patton was clearly impressed with the helmets and even designed a uniform topped off with a football helmet painted gold. The football helmets Sydenham procured for Patton came from the Riddell Company of Chicago, Illinois. When examining the football helmets, Sydenham noted the suspension system and contacted John Riddell, the company owner, for assistance in designing a suspension for the M1 liner. At the same time he was corresponding with Patton and John Riddell, Major Sydenham was working to develop a liner that would fit into the steel M1 helmet shell and hold the suspension. History indicates that Sydenham and his wife Zelma, while living in this house in Fort Benning, used a material called Vinylite in their kitchen and created the first crude prototype M1 liner. They covered it with a cotton twill cover. The liner is now housed at the National Infantry Museum at Fort Benning, Georgia.
It appeared obvious to Sydenham that vinylite probably wasn't the best material to use for making a liner, but the concept would work. He contacted Riddell for additional help in taking the prototype to the next level. John Riddell dispatched his son Jack to Fort Benning to assist in adapting the Riddell suspension into the M1 liner. Urged by Sydenham, the U.S. Army signed a licensing agreement with Riddell to incorporate their suspension into the M1 helmet liner. In Detroit, Michigan, the McCord Radiator Company had been selected by the Army to be the manufacturer of the M1 steel helmet shell. However, they were not able to proceed until a suitable liner could be produced. In a very bold step, McCord contacted the Hawley Products Company in St. Charles, Illinois. Hawley had experience in military headgear as they were currently making tropical helmets for the Marines. McCord engineers who had spoken with and seen Sydenham's design for a liner described it to Hawley designers and convinced them that they could be first in line for a subcontract if they could produce a similar liner that would fit the M1 shell. Hawley did indeed move forward and created a pressed paper liner covered with a cotton twill material fitted with a Riddell style helmet suspension. What's remarkable is that Hawley proceeded without a contract and without an example of the prototype or even official specifications from the Army. The pressed paper liners were covered in a cotton twill and included a leather chin strap and Riddell suspension system. 100 were shipped to Sydenham who presented them to the Army for testing. It was discovered that the Hawley liners fit snugly into the McCord-made M1 steel shells. The Army was impressed and McCord was advised to proceed with the production of the M1 combat helmet with the Hawley liner. Back in Detroit, the process for producing an M1 steel helmet shell was very similar to that of the M1917 of World War I. The same type of steel, Hadfield manganese, was used and the shape of the helmet was pressed in a huge steel die. A rim was placed around the edge of the steel shell and finally chin strap loops were welded on. A heat of the steel stamp was pressed inside the helmet to identify each lot of steel. The helmet was then painted and textured with cork rather than sawdust. Once the helmets were dried, the chin strap was then bar tacked onto the chin strap loops. In 1942, General Patton sent a letter to Major Sydenham requesting additional examples of the Riddell football helmet. Patton's soldiers had recently started to receive the examples of the new M1 helmet with the early liners. Patton, in his own hand, wrote at the end of the letter, We now have some of the new infantry helmets. The liner is the best one that we have tried. High praise indeed for Sydenham and Riddell. The M1 helmet then went into full production with the vast majority of steel shells being produced in Detroit by the McCord Radiator Company. A company called Schluter in St. Louis also produced M1 steel shells. The letter S stamped near the heat of the steel stamp can identify Schluter made M1 helmets. McCord made shells have the heat of the steel stamp but no identifying maker's mark. The chin straps on the early M1 helmet were made from a heavy khaki cotton webbing. On one side of the chin strap, a metal buckle with a small arrow connector fitted between a hook system on the opposite chin strap side. This buckled the chin strap in place. Over the remainder of 1942, Hawley produced some 4 million liners, but eventually it was determined that the liners were not suitable for combat operations. The pressed paper liners were fragile and very susceptible to moisture. They were eventually declared unserviceable and no more were produced. Hawley was recognized by the War Department for its service to the nation and was awarded a Battle E for outstanding war production. Hawley wasn't the only company making liners in the early days of the M1 helmet program. Two other companies, Hood Rubber and St. Clair, also produced early versions of the M1 helmet liner. They used what was called a low pressure method to make helmets from a cloth impregnated with resin. This resulted in a hard plastic-like material. Unlike Hawley's liners, these low-pressure liners featured an insignia eyelid in the front. It should be noted that during the early days of the M1 helmet program, there were very loose standards, and helmet liner makers were getting limited guidance and really no specification information from the Army. Eventually, helmet liners made using the low-pressure method were declared unsuitable for combat. Apparently, they could shatter and produce lethal shards of material when struck. The helmet liners that eventually became standard and preferred by the military were produced using a high pressure method. By this time, specifications were being distributed to liner makers. Companies with household names such as Westinghouse, Firestone, and Inland produced some of the finest high pressure liners. These liners were made from a resin soaked duck cloth that was positioned in a mold and then hydraulically pressed into the correct shape with a force of 150 tons. 
This resulted in a hard, smooth surface, such as this unpainted example. The manufacturing process for converting the raw duck cloth into combat helmets was complex. It required many steps both with machines and by hand. For example, after the duck cloth has been soaked in resin, it was cut into discs and then stamped into a hat shape. Once positioned in their hat shaped form, the liners were then placed onto a conveyor system to be taken to the molds. Upon arriving at the pressing area, a press operator placed the duck cloth liners in the molding press. Here the liners would feel the pressure of the 150 tons and kept in that state for two minutes at 220 degrees to obtain the necessary shape. Once the curing process is completed, the newly pressed helmet liner is removed from the mold. Next, the newly pressed helmet liner went to a press punch. Here an operator inserts the new liner and the machine removes the flash or the excess material from around the edges of the liner. After the flashing is removed, the liner then moves to the next step in the process. Here the raw edge of the liner was burnished to bring about a heat seal. The newly pressed liner is then positioned in a multi-drill press operation where all the rivet holes and insignia eyelets are drilled into the liner. The liner then moves to the rivet station where the rivets and insignia eyelets and web suspension are punched into the still unpainted shell. Once the rivets are installed, the helmet is ready for its finished coat of paint. In this case, the helmet liner is sprayed by hand. Some manufacturers, however, used an automatic system where the liners were sprayed while moving on a conveyor system. The newly painted liners were then placed onto a slow-moving conveyor belt through an infrared oven. Each helmet liner was exposed to the heat for about two minutes to bake the paint onto its surface. Once the helmet completed curing, the liners were then inspected for quality control. Finally, the completed liners were packaged for domestic shipping. Complete with suspensions and chin straps, they were packed in nested stacks of five liners separated by paper. Thirty liners were shipped in each box to be matched up with steel helmet shells. The Riddell suspension was riveted into each helmet liner and then held in place by washers. Early washers were rectangular and later in the war changed to an A-frame style. Originally, M1 helmet liners came with sized headbands and nape straps which snapped into the liner. This caused many problems as it required supply organizations to maintain stocks of various sizes. The earliest suspensions were made from a silver-gray rayon, but eventually this material changed to a khaki herringbone twill cotton. Creative use of clips and buckles eventually permitted the development of a one-size-fits-all headband and nape strap, thus eliminating the need for stocking different sizes. With M1 helmet production in full swing, airborne divisions training with the new helmet soon discovered that when jumping from aircraft, the wind rush often pulled the M1 helmet off a parachutist's head. The standard chin strap also caused great discomfort. A request was submitted to see if modifications to the helmet could be done for the airborne. This resulted in the development of the M2 combat helmet. The M2 combat helmet had two distinct differences from the M1 helmet. First, the chin strap loops were much larger, half moon shaped, and like the M1 were welded to the inside of the helmet shell. These larger loops were to facilitate fastening the chin strap around the rear of the helmet shell to get it out of the way during jumps. The second change was the chin strap itself. The chin strap of an M2 was longer than that of the M1. It featured an additional tab or length of chin strap with a male snap fastener on the end. This tab could be snapped into a female snap inside a modified liner to keep the steel shell and liner together during the jump. The liner for the M2 jump helmet was also modified from the basic M1 helmet liner. The main difference was that during a jump, the primary chin strap holding the helmet in place would come from the liner and not the steel shell. Khaki A-frame webbing holding the chin strap was riveted beneath the liner headband suspension. A female snap was also inserted into each side of the helmet liner to accommodate the male snap on the steel helmet chin strap tab. The M2 jump helmet design was very short-lived as it was discovered that the large chin strap loops were very fragile and constantly bent or broke. This essentially took the helmet out of service until it could be re-welded. Original M2 combat helmets with parachutist configured Holly liners are incredibly rare and in today's collecting circles very valuable. This example has had one of its loops replaced by a hinged chin strap loop made in the field. The chin strap loop problem wasn't just confined to the M2. The basic M1 used a welded chin strap loop and these were also prone to breaking or bending. 
In 1943, the U.S. Army solved the problem by introducing a hinged chinstrap loop. The loop was welded to the inside of the M1 steel shell and could flex in and out. It was a great design and improvement to the combat helmet. However, the chinstrap continued to be sewn to the loop. With the adoption of the hinged chinstrap loop, the M2 jump helmet ceased production and was replaced by the M1C. It was essentially identical to the M2 helmet except for the new chinstrap loop. It was also essentially identical to the basic infantry M1, with the exception that the M1C had the additional chin strap tab on it for connecting it to the liner. Initially, high pressure liners for airborne helmets were produced by Inland in Dayton, Ohio, but eventually the contract went to Westinghouse, who had the highest quality control. Initially, airborne liners relied on leather chin cups, but cost and ease of production prompted a change to cotton canvas near the end of the war. The M1 helmet's steel shell was painted a flat olive drab textured with cork. Even with the cork finished, the helmet had a touch of a shine to it when it was wet. That's clearly something undesirable for combat troops. Soldiers and Marines used a variety of netting to break up the glare and provide a method to insert twigs, leaves, and other natural camouflage. The Type 1 net, as seen on this helmet, was a U.S. Army issue item and was held in place by a neoprene band sewn to the net. When U.S. forces arrived in England, many soldiers acquired nets from British and Canadian soldiers, such as this Type 2 net provided by the Canadian Army. Almost any type of netting was used by soldiers, such as this type, used primarily for camouflaging vehicles and buildings. Occasionally, U.S. soldiers, usually parachute troops, would use a piece of camouflage parachute silk for a helmet cover, but camouflage covers were not widely used in the European theater of operations. The Army did experiment with camouflage helmet covers, however the pattern was considered too similar to that of the German Waffen SS. The Army decided against introducing the covers to combat forces for fear of confusion with the German soldiers. This however was not the case in the Pacific Theater where the U.S. Marine Corps issued camouflage covers to the vast majority of its troops. The original Type 1 Marine helmet cover was reversible with a brown side and a green side and they were made from a herringbone twill cotton. There were no foliage slits. The second pattern of U.S. Marine Corps helmet cover was identical, except that it had 16 foliage slits in rows of two around the perimeter of the cover. The final variant of the U.S. Marine Corps World War II camouflage cover, the Type 3, featured foliage slits at the top of the cover, but there was also a slit in each of the leaves. Exactly what these slits in the leaves were for isn't clear. In each case, the cover slipped over to the steel shell of the helmet, the leaves were tucked in between the shell and the liner. The U.S. Marine Corps Eagle, Globe, and Anchor insignia was not normally used on the cover. Another camouflage cover used by Marines was a thin camouflage cover that incorporated an insect net. This is often incorrectly described as a sniper's cover, but the reality is that the cover was truly to provide some relief to the masses of insects which inhabited the jungles of the Pacific. These insect nets came in camouflage, OD, and khaki. In late 1942, the Westinghouse Company produced 800,000 factory camouflage painted M1 helmet liners. In the Pacific Theater, it was very common for soldiers and Marines to wear just the liner without the steel shell. The camouflage liners were painted using a stencil. This example was worn by a Marine named Jankowski. In pencil, he wrote the names of all the places he served and was very fortunate to survive when his helmet liner was struck by a Japanese bullet. The bullet went through the liner just above his scalp. In 1943, the Quartermaster Corps discontinued the camouflage liner program and 300,000 camo painted liners were repainted olive drab. Surviving examples of these factory camo liners are extremely valuable and quite rare indeed. Unlike World War I, during World War II there were a myriad of specialty painted helmets such as military police and unit marked M1 combat helmets. Obviously they were used to identify specific functions or skills. This helmet, marked in the divisional insignia of the 42nd or Rainbow Division, is an excellent example of a unit marked helmet. The helmet features the divisional patch on the side and the soldier's rank, in this case a first lieutenant on the front. The vertical bar in the rear of the helmet is a tactical marking. It indicates that the person wearing the helmet is an officer. This was so that when troops were moving, they could identify the officer from behind. Another U.S. division famous for wearing its divisional insignia on the helmet was the 3rd Infantry Division. This welded, chin-strap-looped helmet is equipped with an early holly 
fiber liner. The U.S. 1st Division was another unit recognized for not only wearing the big red one on their helmets, but for also landing at Normandy on D-Day. While tank crewmen had specialized tanker's helmet, the M1 helmet was the primary battle helmet for troops assigned to armor. This M1 features the distinctive insignia of the Tank Destroyer Corps. With its bright and obvious Geneva Cross design, U.S. combat medics in Europe were clearly identified. There were very loose standards for how medics were to mark their helmets. This means many different styles and designs can be found. The U.S. 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, also relied on tactical helmet markings within its organization. Using geometric patterns such as circles, triangles, squares, plus hearts, diamonds, spades, and clovers as found in a deck of cards, they developed a simple yet very effective method to identify regiments, battalions, and even companies within the division. While most U.S. combat helmets went to ground forces, the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard also made use of the M1 helmet. When issued to Navy units, the M1 was in its factory olive drab, but many were repainted either gray or dark blue. This Navy M1 sports a gloss gray finish and is marked to a Navy signalman. Adding artwork to a helmet wasn't simply the domain of the Army. This wonderful example of a U.S. Navy painted helmet was worn by Henry Raphael, a Coast Guard photographer who wore the helmet throughout his service in the war. Not only did his helmet and its artwork survive the war, but a remarkable wartime photograph showing this actual helmet moments after its photographic logo was painted on the front also survived the war. In addition to the M1 helmet, U.S. Navy forces also used a specialty helmet, the Mark II Talker helmet. This oversized helmet was used by gunners and communications specialists aboard naval vessels. The helmet had a built-in suspension and was large to accommodate headphones and communications gear. The Mark II Talker continued to serve with U.S. naval forces into the 1990s. The M1 helmet proved its value. Post-war estimates indicate that some 35,000 American soldiers would have been killed were it not for its protective qualities. The helmet was worn by every branch of service, from trainee privates to high-ranking general officers. From its lineage back to Riddell's football helmet suspension to its experimental TS-3 days, the M1 helmet held up to the challenges of combat and set the standard for combat helmets of its day. Harold G. Sydenham's M1 helmet would continue to endure and protect American and Allied soldiers for decades to come. With its proven World War II track record, the U.S. M1 helmet continued to serve in various configurations with the U.S. military in both the Korean conflict and the Vietnam War. In fact, the U.S. M1 had a 40-year span of service. From the end of World War II until the start of the Korean War, very little was done in the way of upgrades to the M1 helmet. With over 22 million M1 steel shells produced, there wasn't much need to produce additional helmets. Essentially, the U.S. military repaired and recycled millions of helmets over the next decades. While many of the M1 helmets worn in Korea were still in their original World War II configuration, repainting and repair was common. After World War II, many different tints of olive drab were used and often helmets were repainted in the field with whatever color was at hand. Often fine sand or silica gel was used for texture rather than cork. Consequently, Korean War era configured M1 helmets can be found in many different color shades, but the most typical have dark, semi-gloss appearance. Since the end of World War II, the biggest changes to the M1 steel shell were to improve the chin strap. This included the T1 chin strap clamp, which was now used to attach the strap to the helmet rather than by sewing it on. This made repairs to the chin strap far easier. Also, the T1 chin strap release clip was made standard on the M1 helmet and retrofitted to almost all M1 helmets. The chin strap itself was changed from khaki webbing to the now standard olive drab number no. 7. While few, if any, steel M1 shells were produced after World War II, there's no doubt M1 liners were manufactured. Like the chin strap, the biggest change to the liner was the adoption of olive drab number no. 7, replacing khaki as the color for the suspension. The suspension webbing was still made from a herringbone twill design, as it was in World War II. After World War II, the use of the term M1C to describe an airborne helmet was discontinued, and helmets were now described as either infantry or parachutist. The Korean-era parachutist helmet shell was identical to the infantry shell, with the exception that the chin strap had the additional airborne tab which was snapped into the liner. 
The Korean era parachutist liner was nearly identical to the World War II liner, except the suspension color was now olive drab number seven, and the A-frame webbing used for the chin strap was now independently riveted to the body and was not beneath the headband suspension as they were in World War II. As with World War II, the U.S. Marines continued the tradition of wearing their M1 combat helmets with camouflage helmet covers. These covers were essentially identical to the World War II second pattern. Unlike World War II, it was very common to see these covers with the Marine Corps' famous eagle, globe, and anchor insignia stenciled on the front. Army personnel occasionally wore camouflaged helmet covers, but these were usually scraps of camouflage parachute or covers liberated from Marines. The late 50s and early 60s often saw creative field-made examples of helmet covers, such as this field-made cover made from a piece of U.S. Marine Corps utility uniform. When the Korean War ended in 1953, U.S. helmet designers continued to try to improve the functionality of helmets. This modified M1 helmet was the basis for testing a radio helmet. It featured a battery system attached to the rear of the helmet and an antenna attached to the crown. This evolved to a helmet called the ANPRC-34X1, an experimental helmet radio made from a heavy composite material similar to that used in helmet liners. The helmet used a parachutist-style chin strap assembly with a battery and a two-way radio system installed inside the helmet. There was no steel shell for the ANPRC-34X1 due to the antenna. The idea of a helmet-borne radio system later evolved to the ANPRC-36X1. The battery of this helmet was carried on a soldier's belt while the radio, antenna, and speakers were attached to the helmet. In the late 1950s, several changes were made to the M1 combat helmet liner. The material used in the suspension changed from the dark herringbone twill weave to a thicker cotton weave that was a lighter shade of green. In addition, the insignia eyelet punched in the front of the helmet was discontinued. As the U.S. became more entrenched and involved in attempting to stem the spread of communism in Vietnam, the M1 helmet remained the main battle helmet of U.S. forces from all branches of service. A new helmet cover was developed by the Army's Experimental Research and Development Laboratory was adopted by all branches of the military. The cover was reversible, with one side being a green leaf-like pattern and the reverse tan and brown circular patterns. It was often referred to as the Mitchell pattern, but no one really seems to know why. The covers were held in place by a neoprene band. In 1961, the material used in making helmet liners was changed to nylon. The interior of the liners now had an orange and green appearance. In approximately 1965, the original Riddell suspension configuration had also evolved. No longer was there a center tie, but now three crossing strips of cotton served as the primary suspension. Unlike the liners of World War II in Korea, the entire suspension could be removed from the liner shell. The liner also had three small buckles riveted to it. These held a new neck band in place. In the 1960s, it was very common for U.S. military forces to have painted helmet liners designating specialty career fields or ceremonial units. This is evidenced by these two U.S. Air Force Security Police painted liners. The Mitchell pattern helmet cover wasn't the only helmet cover used by U.S. forces. Occasionally forces used a tiger stripe pattern. In 1973, a new helmet cover was also designed. This was the Woodland camouflage pattern and was not reversible. This design saw limited use in the Vietnam War. The 1970s and 80s saw the M1 helmet's steel shell remain unchanged since World War II, except for its color and texture. The liner and the chin strap systems, however, continued to change and evolve. Snaps and webbed chin cups replaced T1 connectors, and eventually nylon replaced all the cotton webbing in the chin straps. In the 1980s, a thicker type of nylon was used to manufacture the liners. The result was an iguana green interior. These were the final versions of the M1 liner, and strangely, they seemed to be the worst made as they often didn't fit well into the helmets and they weren't symmetrical. The final airborne version of the M1 was made of the same material and continued to rely on an A-frame webbing for its chin strap. From its humble beginning in World War II until the late 1980s, the M1 helmet served America's combat forces for five decades. The number of lives it saved can only be imagined. It remains one of the finest and most copied pieces of individual combat equipment ever produced. Since the adoption of a steel combat helmet in 1917, the U.S. military always tried to improve the design. In the 1950s, they made a conscious effort to look at material other than steel. 
That resulted in the 1980s PASGT, the Personal Armor System Ground Troops Helmet. Even before the end of World War II, the U.S. military started working on ways to improve the combat helmet. In the 50s, several interesting designs were attempted, including this tropical-style helmet, which looks similar to the Liberty Bell experimental model of World War I. A post-World War II study titled Military Helmet Design, compiled at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, made the following recommendations regarding a new combat helmet. First, the one-size-fits-all M1 helmet should be replaced with a helmet available in three sizes. Secondly, the helmet should provide protection against radiation, heat, wind, and cold. Finally, ballistic materials other than steel should be considered. Between 1948 and 1955, the military conducted experiments with the X generation of helmets. The X-49, X-50, X-51, X-52, and X-53. Like the experimental helmets of World War I, the X helmets were designed at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The common denominator for these helmets was that the shells were all made from aluminum and the liners nylon. They were deeper and far lighter than the steel M1 helmet and its liner. It was hoped the lightweight X helmets could fill the role for a variety of combat forces, infantry, tank crews, air crews, and airborne. In airborne tests, however, every parachutist lost his helmet during a jump due to the poorly designed, oversized T1-type chinstrap clip. The helmet was far from ballistic with its aluminum shell, and while it was made in several sizes with various test configurations, none of the X helmets were adopted. There were also attempts to maintain the basic shape of the M1 helmet, but to use different materials. In the late 1960s, several M1-style helmets were produced from titanium. These helmets had no rim, as the steel M1 helmets did, and were slightly lighter. In a head-to-head -head test with steel helmets, the titanium helmets proved to be far stronger than their steel counterparts. Several liner versions were tested, including a Wilson Davis design suspension that relied on leather, plastic, and Velcro. Another version of the titanium M1 style helmet had the suspension secured directly inside the titanium shell. This resulted in a smaller profile and a lighter helmet. Approximately 1,000 titanium helmets plus an unknown amount of M1 helmets made completely from nylon were produced, but none apparently entered active service. Managing the testing of various types of materials for the new helmet program, now called the Personal Armor System Ground Troop, or PASGT, sometimes called the PASKET, fell to Project Officers Larry McManus and Phil Durand, who worked at Natick. They coordinated the development and testing of new helmets constructed of ballistic materials and Kevlar. Several early prototypes of the PASGT helmet were originally created with an epoxy resin. The camouflage design was printed directly onto the helmet. Unlike the M1 helmet, there was no liner for the PASGT. While it retained the same basic Riddell-style suspension, it was riveted directly to the protective shell. Another material tested was a type of fiberglass reinforced with plastic called GRP. The fiberglass provided the ballistic protection while the plastic helped the helmet maintain its shape. Interestingly, one of the project managers was asked about the camouflage pattern and he replied that it was primarily a marketing gimmick to make the helmet more attractive to the military. This prototype PASGT is equipped with a Vietnam-era reversible cover. What's interesting about this helmet is the suspension which could be removed. The liner was cradled in a protective rubber edge that fit over the flare of the helmet. There were no screws needed to hold the system in place. The style of liner was experimental only and was not produced for combat forces. This was the basic PASGT when all testing and development was completed. Scientists and developers determined this was a very optimal design for functionality and safety. How ironic is it that similar designs created by Bashford Dean's team in 1918, such as the Model 2 and Model 5, were declined, only to have a very similar design adopted some 60 years later. Early in the PASGT program, it was determined that the helmet would be used with a camouflage cover. This is an example of a very early experimental cover for the PASGT. It was ultimately declined and the standard pattern became woodland camouflage. An interesting and rarely seen PASGT cover is that of the Multinational Force and Observers. 
Since 1982, an independent, non-UN peacekeeping force composed of approximately 550 U.S. soldiers plus soldiers from other nations are stationed in the Sinai to verify, observe, and report on the status of peace between Egypt and Israel. They wear the bright orange helmet cover to identify themselves as observers. When the PASGT was finally issued to combat forces in the early 1980s, the helmet weighed in at approximately 3 pounds. The suspension remained very similar to that used in the World War II liner. Initially, the U.S. military ordered 1 million helmets at a cost of $97 per helmet. They first saw action in the U.S. invasion of Grenada. As tensions grew in the Middle East in the late 1980s, the U.S. military geared up for possible action in the region. This resulted in the desert camouflage designs. Early desert PASGT covers consisted of a six-color chocolate chip pattern. These were eventually replaced by a three-color pattern as worn on the helmet you see here. Incidentally, this helmet is also equipped with a mount for night vision goggles. Both styles of helmet covers saw action in Operation Desert Storm. Recently, the U.S. Marine Corps adopted a new camouflage pattern called MARPAT, or Marine Pattern. This is a cutting-edge digital design which enhances camouflage and makes it even more difficult to see a Marine even if an adversary is using night vision devices. The helmet covers are reversible with a green pattern and a desert pattern. Printed right into the pattern of the camouflage is the Marine Corps Eagle, Globe, and Anchor insignia. Variations of the digital camo are being adopted by the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. In addition to improved digital camouflage, the U.S. Marine Corps has worked to develop a lightweight Marine Corps version of the PASGT. While it appears to be an identical copy of the original helmet, it actually weighs approximately 7 ounces less. There are also upgrade kits to improve the suspension system. In the early 21st century, the U.S. military unveiled its newest combat helmet, the MISH, or Modular Integrated Communications Helmet that provides ballistic and impact protection. The helmet can be used with the newest night vision equipment, nuclear, biological, and chemical gear, communication packages, and body armor. The name MISH implied the helmet came with communications gear, but that gear was destined to be used by Special Operations Force and Delta operators. The Army opted to rename the helmet the ACH, or Advanced Combat Helmet. The helmet was designed to provide a soldier maximum sensory ability, both sight and sound. The helmet weighs in at just over 3 pounds. The ACH featured a completely different suspension than the PASGT. It relies on pads held in place with Velcro. They can be moved and configured for each soldier's individual comfort. They provide exceptional balance, support, and stability. The ACH has seen its first combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan during America's War on Terror. The helmet has been very successful. Military personnel who have used the helmet in the theater of operations reported it's a very comfortable helmet to wear. While it still weighs about as much as the older PASGT, the improved suspension disperses the weight better. One criticism is that the chin strap design does interfere to a certain extent with peripheral vision if the helmet isn't adjusted correctly. Since 1917, the combat helmet has been an essential piece of equipment for all members of the U.S. Armed Forces. Evolving from a borrowed British design in World War I, innovators like Bashford Dean, Harold Sydenham, John and Jack Riddell, Phil Durand and Lawrence McManus elevated the design and protective qualities of the American combat helmet over the course of the 20th century. Through their efforts and the efforts of untold individuals and companies working closely with the U.S. military, the professional men and women serving in America's military have, since World War II, been equipped with the standard by which all combat helmets are measured. Mm -hmm.